So first, let me start by saying that uh, Wayne County has really showed up and showed out. <laughs> um, I'm glad to see all of you here. Um, you know, this is, I grew up in Wilson, but uh, as, as Marty said, uh, my roots are, my father's roots, my, my paternal roots are here in Wayne County in both the northern part of the county and the southern part of the county. Long been a research interest of mine. Uh, I am thankful to Marty and the uh, Wayne County Public Library for inviting me. Um, I was all too pleased to come. Um, and as he said, I'm going to be talking about uh, free people of color in Wayne County. I'll, let me start by saying it's a, it's a huge topic. Yeah. And um, there's what I call the Bible of, of the history of free people of color in North Carolina. And that is that is was written by John Hope Franklin in the 1940s. And it's called The Free Negro in North Carolina. There's a copy here in the library. It's still in print. Um, I encourage anyone who's interested at all in this topic to get that and read that book. Because what I want to do here tonight is really focus on Wayne County and, and do that by sharing documents that relate to free people of color here and uh, photographs. <coughs> so. Uh, that's what that's what I plan to do. Um, if you imagine a, a diagonal drawn to connect the Tobacco Ridge counties of Southside Virginia to the rice fields of Upper uh, South Carolina, halfway along, you'd be right here in Wayne County, sort of between these big plantation areas. Um, slavery was well established in Wayne County early on but the county was never dominated by plantations. However, with the arrival of the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad in 1936, uh, Wayne County farmers began to grow cash crops such as cotton and tobacco. Still, most grew mostly food crops like corn, beans, peas, potatoes. The overwhelming majority of Wayne County's population throughout the antebellum period and that's roughly 1800 to, to about 1860, consisted of whites and enslaved African Americans. But the earliest federal censuses also counted a tiny third population, free people of color. This term essentially applied to any free person who was not considered white. The evidence reveals that Wayne County's free people of color primarily comprised people of mixed heritage, African, European, and Native American. The 1790 census was the first federal census, and it counted just under 90 free people of color in Wayne County. Uh, there were probably more, but that's, that's who got, got, got counted. Few headed their own households. Most were listed uh, with the white families that they worked for. And this is, what, this is a page from the 1790 census of Wayne County. And here are, this is typically, so these are columns. This one, if you, it's a little hard to read, it says all other free uh, persons. So the slave column is this one. This is all other free people. And this would be free people of color. So this household, as you can see, has one white um, Male, it's a little hard for me. I need some new glasses and my focal points are not all that uh, tight yet. But anyway, the, the important thing here is four. So there were four free people of color living in um, Benjamin uh, Sweat's household. Mm -hmm. Over here we have Mary Hagen's. If you see these spaces are blank and then there's one. Mary Hagen's was a free woman of color living by herself. Uh, here's another household. This is uh, Arthur Cook who had uh, one free person of color living in his household. So most in the 1790 census, and actually up through about 1840, most free people of color are simply anonymous numbers in a column on the census. Mm -hmm. By 1820, the census uh, taker counted 146 free people of color in Wayne County, although there were, again, likely more who missed count. In 1830, only 139 free people of color were counted, but in 1840, the census uh, taker encountered 464, most of whom lived in one of 77 households headed by men and women of color. So by 1840, 
people had begun to um, to to be economically uh, uh, to have the economic wherewithal to head their own households. By then, there were two clusters of settlement that had emerged for people for free people of color in Wayne County. They were centered around what is now known as Eureka in the northern part of the county and Dudley in the southern part of the county. Uh, many free families had been in the community for generations. Others were among a handful of men and women who were manumented by their owners in the county courts. This is an example of a petition for manumission. Uh, this woman, uh, she's referred to here as Suki Borden, her name was Susan. Uh, she lived in Goldsboro, actually, so she was not in one of those two centers, but there, there were a small population of free people of color in Goldsboro. And um, it's not dated, but it, it, off the top of my head, I believe it was, it was 1950s, I mean, 1850s, I'm sorry, when uh, Suki was uh, manumented. And this is a list of all the um, prominent men who supported her manumission. Uh, here's another, this is earlier. Um, I, this again is undated, but judging by the handwriting, I would say this is the late 1700s, very early 19, uh, 1800s. Uh, this is a petition by William Newsom to free a man named Charles. And then uh, another was, uh, ben um, uh, the, the, the enslaved person was named Willis. Benaja Herring uh, sought his freedom. And this is an interesting one because it has a quite a bit of detail about, um, about Willis. He was raised by Michael Herring, who formerly lived in the county. Uh, he then lived with Ichabod Herring. He's been sober, indu industrious, faithful, on and on and on. And uh, Willis was freed as a result of this uh, petition as well. And these are, these are records that are found in the um, North Carolina State Archives in, up in Raleigh. Um, another way that people sort of form, join the community or the community expanded um, is less commonly known. And these are um, free people of color who are descended from white women who bore children by black or mixed race fathers. Uh, there were more uh, of these types of families than people commonly um, would expect here in the 1850 census are two examples. Uh, this is Celia Vick, um, who you see this is blank. This is the column for race. Uh, she was white. She had two daughters, Martha and Mary, twins, uh, who were both described as, as mulatto. The same thing with Catherine Bass. Uh, she was white. Her children, Delpha and uh, Malvina, uh, were also listed as mulatto. So there were a number of families uh, like this. In, in fact, um, the, uh, the, the Aldridges, um, the Hendersons, these are families that are descended from, that sort of started essentially with a white woman who had children uh, by a man of color. Um, however, migration of free people of color from nearby counties, especially Sampson, Duplin, Green, Johnston and Edgecombe were the chief cause of the enormous increase in the number of free people of color in Wayne County between 1830 and 1860. So you had lots of people coming in from surrounding counties and joining these communities again in the southern part of the county and in the northern part of the county. In 1840, for example, one third of the 36 free uh, colored ha heads of household in Davis District, which is essentially now the Fremont Eureka area, were named artists. So that one family um, had started moving in in droves in the 1830s and 40s. So now I know this is hard to read, I can't hardly read this, but <coughs> this is a page from the 1840 census of Davis District. And let me see if I'm, here, let me see, this is one, this is an artist. So you see it's blank all the way across until you get to free colored <coughs> persons. And all of these hash marks, all these numbers are counting free people of color who were living just in Davis District. So there's an artist, um, there's, uh, there's another artist, there's another artist, there's another artist, um, here's another artist, 
There were there were lots, lots and lots. And uh, here's a Hagen's. Um, so again, this is just one part of the northern part of the county. The artists had begun to shift their settlements from Edgecombe County into northern Wayne County in the early 1830s. They had been slowly drifting south from Virginia mm -hmm. since they were uh, since their common ancestors were manumitted genu generations earlier. So the artists were freed in Virginia in the early 1700s and slowly began to migrate south so that by the 1800s you find them across <coughs> uh, eastern North Carolina but the biggest concentration of artists was in Wilson uh, was in Wayne County and ultimately probably all artists are related probably <laughs> but they go you know there were so many and they sort of get back past the, the, the records. So um, genetic genealogy, DNA ge uh, genealogy may help sort of combine some of the artist lines and, and help us you know, understand um, how many artist families there, there were. But generally there's one, one big artist family. Um, alongside the artists, the Hagens, the Reed, the Hall families also moved in from Edgecombe County. And in the South, the Simmonses, the Manuals, and the Winds were pushing north from Duplin and Sampson into the Mount Olive, Indian Springs, and Dudley area. Wayne County absorbed migrant families from all of its neighboring counties. By 1860, Wayne County had the ninth largest population of free people of color in North Carolina's 86 counties. So that sort of begs the question, why, why Wayne County? Uh, most of the other counties with large free populations bordered South Carolina. So we're talking Halifax, Hertford counties, um, uh, you know, all along that area. Or they bordered the South, Ca South Carolina uh, line. Um, or they contained one of the large towns in North Carolina at the time, like Raleigh or New Bern <coughs> or Wilmington. N Wayne County doesn't fit any of those uh, categories. Uh, one push is clear. You know, there's always push and pull sort of factors in, in why people um, make, the, make the decisions that they do. One push, um, it, by the 1850s, there ha was a long simmering hostility toward free people of color that sort of broke out into the open. There had been a uh, a couple of uh, attempted slave rebellions in Sampson and Duplin counties uh, right after the Nat Turner uh, rebellion up in Virginia. And uh, the, the major one was in Duplin and actually a free man of color betrayed the um, rebellion. His name was, his name was Levin Armwood. Uh, Sorry to all the onwards in here. <laughs> so he, he betrayed the he betrayed the rebellion, but um, you know even even despite that, there was an anger um, at what was perceived as assistance that free people of color had given to enslaved people, and and a real distrust of of the relationship between free people of color and enslaved people, and there was a big crackdown. On the uh, on the communities and, and lots of rights that were that were stripped away um, in the 1850s, white citizens of both Sampson and Duplin counties sent petitions to the North Carolina General Assembly, requesting that it pass a statute exiling from the state all free people of color. Uh, men who signed the Duplin petition suggested that free people of color who refused to leave be sold into slavery, and the proceeds be used to defray the cost of passage to Liberia for the others. Uh, in these circumstances, it may be that Wayne County's Quaker families were a, a, a draw, that the anti-slavery work of these families made Wayne County seem a relative haven compared to some of the surrounding counties. Um, like Quakers in North Carolina's Piedmont, Friends in Wayne County's Contentnia meeting attempted to, by various means to manumit their slaves um, until the state cracked down on them uh, in the 1820s and, and 30s. 
Thomas Kennedy, for example, who was a Wayne County farmer, worked with the North Carolina Yearly Meeting to resettle freedmen in Haiti, and he and others uh, contributed to the American Colonization Society. Still, though there weren't any petitions out of Wayne County uh, seeking to enslave uh, free people of color, there was hostility nonetheless. The Goldsboro Patriot, uh, which was a, a local newspaper, published an editorial in 1850 calling for the removal of all free black people from the state. The writer declared, none will deny that in removing this class of people from the scenes of their childhood where they enjoy health, plenty, and happiness, a deep and lasting wound will pierce the heart of all. However, stern necessity, the safety of our people, and a proper regard for the welfare and subordination of the slave population demanded such legislation. Moreover, Wayne County's white community tolerated men like Fernifold Jernigan, who headed a conspiracy of prominent farmers that kidnapped and sold free children into slavery. In 1837, Jernigan was indicted for selling Betsy Dink Dinkins, a free woman of color. In the three years from 1834 to 1837, Jernigan and at least four co-defendants appeared in the Wayne County criminal docket 10 times on charges of selling free Negroes, mm. but never went to trial. Uh, as a result of the state solicitor's complaint to the judge, uh, the case was ordered removed to Greene County where he felt that he could maybe get a fairer trial, but the case never appeared on the docket there and Furnifold Jernigan, Jernigan went on to be a prominent citizen here in, in Wayne County. So here is, this is a newspaper article from Salisbury, 1834. We learned this infamous <coughs> business is carrying on to a considerable extent near the lines of the counties of Samson, Wayne, and Johnson, and that five free persons of color have been abducted from the neighborhood by a set of daring outlaws and most probably have been sold into bondage. If these things be so, it is time for the citizens of that neighborhood to be active in their exertion to bring the offenders to justice. The cause of suffering humanity calls upon them for a generous effort on behalf of this unfortunate class of our population. The, violent laws, the violated laws of the state require them, as good citizens, to use every possible means to vindicate its humane and merciful provisions, ferreting out and bringing to justice, bringing to punishment its invaders. This is... Um, this is the, the request of the county solicitor. Uh, he made oath that he does not believe the state can have a fair trial. This matter has, this is uh, state versus, state versus Furnifold Jernigan. Um, the, the matter has been a, a subject of much conversation. The defendant, by the influence of several men of standing, has made it much the matter of general discussion and uh, basically it would be a mere mockery to enter upon this trial in Wayne. And so he, nothing ever happened to Jernigan or his, uh, his co-defendants. So uh, men and women uh, of color who were abroad without their free papers could expect arrest by uh, the same patrollers who were out <coughs> looking for, uh, for delinquent enslaved people and even elderly uh, residents of the county were harassed by challenges to their freedom. There is an interesting, fascinating set of documents um, in, the, in the records in, in, in Raleigh. They, it's four affidavits given by uh, uh, white affiants concerning Farabee Simmons. Farabee Simmons is the uh, matriarch of all of the Wayne County Simmonses. She, she had a bunch of children, and so there are many lines that descend from Faraby, and it's not really, it's, not, it's pretty difficult to kind of tease them all out, but essentially Faraby is the, is the matriarch. And here is the text of one of these. So Jesse Martin says he has known Faraby Simmons, a free woman of color, for the last 60 or 65 years was raised within two miles of her. She was the first free colored person he recollects he ever saw, and she was called Free Farabee in the neighborhood. She uh, never was considered to be a slave. She lived with William Burnham. She and Burnham would have a falling out sometimes, and she th threatened to leave him, but Burnham said, Burnham, and they would have to compromise to keep her from leaving, but she was considered by all who knew him to be free, 
and has so remained. So there are, again, four of these. One, one mentions the fact that she was originally from Bertie County, that she had been apprenticed uh, to the Burnham family and had uh, traveled from uh, Bertie County to Wayne County with the Burnhams. Reading between the lines here, there is some suggestion that Burnham is the father of at least some of her children. Um, there is a suggestion here of, of a relationship um, uh, between them. Uh, and and this, these four affidavits were registered in the county court. Now, at this time, Fairby would have been 80 years old. Um, so that she felt the need to record, to have some sort of official you know, record of her free status um, speaks volumes. Uh, I suspect that this in part, some of Farabee's children and grandchildren had started to migrate out of, out of North Carolina. By this point, this is 1853 when this was filed, and would have been traveling. They wound up in Ohio, and they would have been traveling, of course, through Virginia, through a couple of slave states to get to Ohio. And I imagine that she wanted to have this uh, evidence there so that, so that if her children encountered any difficulties <coughs> migrating, that they would have some sort of official documentation of their status. Uh, free people of color were always under observation. In the 1820s and 30s, North Carolina's legislature unleashed a spate of reactionary laws severely curtailing the rights and activities of free people of color. And the Constitutional Convention of 1835 stripped them of the right to vote. For example, to own a gun, essential in a time in which there, were, there was no police force and hunting was a critical source of food, free men of color were required to obtain the support of neighbors and court approval. So this is a petition uh, on behalf of Hillary Kaur, who was a free man of color. He petitioned the Court of Pleas and Quarter Sessions, which is uh, for the first level local court, for a gun license, uh, to use a gun for, for one year. Um, I don't know what was going on with the Second Amendment, but um, <laughs> he had to have a gun license, uh, and he had to have neighbors who would vouch for his, um, his that he was a good guy, basically, and, 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 and should be able to, to carry a gun. This is an interesting side note with Hillary Coor, who was also known as Hillary <coughs> Croom. Um, his wife was enslaved. His children, therefore, were enslaved. Their owner uh, moved to Alabama migrated to Alabama. Um, he could not follow them to Alabama uh, because if a free person of color left, once they left the state of North Carolina, they were not allowed to return uh, without losing their free status. Um, he wanted to purchase his wife and children and he petitioned <coughs> the state to be allowed to travel to Alabama to uh, purchase his family and to come back and for them to be allowed to settle here because it was also illegal to, to immigrate into North Carolina as a free person of color. Um, he was okay to carry a gun. He was not okay to uh, unite his family. The interactions of free people of color with enslaved people were especially scrutinized. This is a, you know, being an example, which deepened the, per, the precariousness of family ties. Marriages between free people of color and enslaved people, though illegal, were not uncommon. This is a, this is the, uh, a transcription of an ad that was placed in the Raleigh Register in 1824 for a runaway uh, slave. Um, he lived in the uh, Stansburg area. Now, you know, at this time, there was no Wilson County, and the area of Wilson County that is now Black Creek, sort of on up towards Stansburg, was Wayne County at that time. So it's not entirely clear. He has a free wife by the name of Rancy Artist living near Stansburg. 
it's not clear whether that's in what would now be Wilson County or what would now be Wayne. Um, but even now, people in Wayne County have Stansburg addresses. Mm -hmm. So it, it's up in that area. It says he's likely to pass for a, uh, a free man. Um, and uh, Joel Newsom filed this, uh, placed this ad. Even as free people of color were drawn to Wayne County, they did not necessarily find prosperity and remained overall painfully poor. Even during the era of the railroad, which expanded uh, economic opportunities in Wayne County, times were hard for free people of color, most of whom were propertyless and unskilled. In 1860, the total reported wealth for 737 free uh, colored Wayne County residents was $22,360, which is a little more than $30 a person. Um, only 20 men and women reported owning real property, meaning land, and uh, only another 30 claimed personal property, meaning they had enough farm tools or, or that sort of thing to, to actually claim, uh, claim a value. Charles Wynn, a blacksmith uh, who had recently come into the county from Duplin County, alone came, uh, claimed 2,800 of the 22,000. So he, he, more than 10% of that amount was, was wealth that accrued to one person. Overall, uh, the per capita value of real property, property for free people of color was $16.91. For whites, it was $344. Uh, there was um, th the $12,640 in real property claimed by free colored landowners in 1860 represented less than four tenths of 1% of the total cash value of Wayne County Farms in that area. So it just tells you these were really poor people, desperately poor people. Uh, most of Wayne County's poorest free people of color worked as laborers on their neighbors' farms. A few men and women worked in Goldsboro um, as washerwomen or woodcutters or other unskilled laborers. And there were a few uh, in that had trades, like Asa Artis, who was a cooper, Thomas Barfield, who was a turpentine hand, and these people would hire on with anyone uh, who needed their skills. They worked for wages. Uh, Dempsey Hall and his wife Martha typified the social and economic position of most free families of color. In the 1850 census, the couple and their three daughters lived in one household of a small cluster of related families in Davis District. And remember, Davis District is Fremont, Eureka area. Martha Hall was born uh, a Reed. She had been apprenticed as a child. Her husband Dempsey was a farmhand, but he owned no property. Ten years later, when the census taker came, Dempsey Hall's father, Robert, uh, a farm laborer, uh, lived in their household. And Dempsey, though he called himself a farmer, still had no land and only $30 in personal property. There was no public relief, of course, during this time. Uh, there was a Wayne County poorhouse, uh, but it was not generally open to free people of color. So people were pretty much uh, on their own. Um, single women in particular had few uh, employment opportunities beyond farm work. And their narrows, uh, of course, uh, their, their options narrowed if they had children to care for. Domestic work was scarce. Uh, though some f free women of color who lived in Goldsboro found work in service occupations. Susan Borden, who was the woman whose manumission petition that we saw, uh, worked as a baker in Goldsboro after she was freed in 1852. And she had a housemate named Angia Capps, who was a seamstress. Uh, the census that year showed a set of sisters, Delphia, Zel Zilpha, and Martha Artis, uh, who were laundresses and uh, another woman, Elizabeth Higgins, who was also a laundress. Uh, most, re most women, though, reported no occupation at all uh, to the census taker. Although it was unevenly enforced, the law required that the children of unmarried women of color be indentured until 21 to a responsible adult. And this kind of apprenticeship, even if involuntary, saved some children from terrible want. Now, when I say unmarried, what I mean is 
not married in a way that was legally recognized. So subject to apprenticeship were the children of women who gen genuinely were not married, but also the children of women who were married to enslaved men. Those were not marriages that were recognized under the law, so those women were considered to be unmarried. Here's um, an example. Here, Eliza Hagens is told uh, to come into court with her children, uh, Lavinia and Rebecca, and she is to show cause, if any, why her children should not be bound out to service. So what typically would happen is that someone would report to the court that, you know, there's this woman who lives in, in the area and, you know, she's got these children. I don't know what she's doing to support them. I would like to suit to apprentice them mm -hmm. and a summons would go out. And um, Marty mentioned that I wrote a, a master's thesis um, on the involuntary apprenticeship of, of uh, free children of color in Wayne County. And what I found was that typically ch the, 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 the farmers who apprenticed children most often were young farmers who could not afford slaves. And so as they were starting out in their, um, not careers, but starting out as farmers, you had a choice. You can buy land or you can buy slaves. So if you can get your labor some other way, um, then you can buy land. And apprenticing children, you then you, you have their labor until the age of 21. And uh, this was essentially a system of supplying labor to certain classes of farmer, uh, typically, again, what we call yeoman farmers, not the wealthiest uh, white <coughs> farmers, not the poorest, um, but somewhere in between, people who, who, who had aspirations to own two or three or four slaves one day. Um, I'll give you an example. Benjamin Acock, father of C.B. Acock, mm -hmm. apprenticed a whole bunch of free children of color, serially. Mm -hmm. uh, people would, people would, would apprentice whole groups of children. Um, by the end of the, the antebellum period, the price of slaves was through the roof. People couldn't afford them. So you would go, if you could find a set, people would go, it, it, it's insane. You have, somebody would go in and they would apprentice literally six children ages nine months to 10. I mean, there's nothing that a nine month can do for you, you know, but you want to lock that down so that you have access to that labor for the next 20 years until you can afford your own, um, your own slave. This is an example of, a, of an apprentice bond. Um, you may notice that the uh, parent of the child is nowhere on here. Uh, the parent <coughs> of the child was not a party. The child is Ned, who is four years old. And um, the, the, uh, Ezekiel Slocum was the person who was going to uh, apprentice him, and these, these other men would serve as, as, their, as bond. Uh, so Ned was four, and in, 1920, in 1820, and so he would have had to have served uh, his uh, master, as they were called, um, until 1837, until he was 21 years old. Some, some women attempted to um, leverage what little power they had to try to select a particular master for their children. They would work out arrangements with uh, farmers, neighboring farmers. Um, again, if you look at some of these documents, there is an inference that sometimes we are talking about familial relationships. Sometimes we are talking about women who bore children with white men who would work out an arrangement uh, so that the, the man was, was responsible for um, caring for the, ch providing for the children uh, legally. Of course, he had to be willing to do this. I mean, you couldn't go in and say, this is my children's father. Um, but uh, you'll see um, th there are a, a few petitions. Here's one. 
Zilly Hagen's. I, I wish I had. Uh, I wish I had 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 brought along. A, an, there's a prior petition. That's a really desperate um, document, in which she is saying that she's she's pleading to the court that she has been reported. Uh, it's been reported to the court that her children are running around the neighborhood without anything to eat and, and are uncared for. And she's basically saying it's not true. And she's begging the court not to take her children from her because they had just reached an age where they were old <coughs> enough to work and to provide her household with, with, with uh, sustenance. And she was asking for them not to, to bind her, her children. Here, she, is, she has a different sort of plea, and that is, can you please bind my son, Sherard, to Exum Pike? Because basically, I have an arrangement with Pike, and, and he's going he's gonna to basically provide me with, with, with food and, and shelter <coughs> as well as, as, as my son. So this is in 1833, and again, there was a little note here that says that Sherard is about 17 years of age. So he wasn't... Pike wasn't going to get a whole lot of years out of out of um, Sherrod Hagen's, but he, as a 17-year-old, he would have been capable. He would have been in his physical prime, and and so a very desirable um, apprentice. Now, of course, every free woman of color was not poor. Some were well able to support their children, and were in fact uh, owners of considerable amounts of property. Celia Artis. Brought, bought her first 10 acres in 1833. In, in 1850, she valued at, seven, uh, at $600 the 750 acres of land that she owned, and she grew corn, rice, uh, potatoes, tobacco. She had hogs, she had cattle. Um, at one point, she owned as many as eight slaves. Um, but in 1850, by 1850, she reported only one, and it was her husband. I imagine that the other enslaved people that uh, were listed with her were also family members. Um, but she was she was married to an enslaved man, and they had six or seven children together. The children, of course, followed the mother's status, so her children were free. Um, there is a document in during the Civil War. There were these really detailed maps drawn, field maps drawn, in which all you know farms are listed, and they were sort of used to, you know, for. I, I'm not a Civil War historian, but people sort of, you know, they were used for lots of reasons. They're maps. So the map of the northern part of Wayne County. It's very hard to read. I, mean, I bear with me. Up here. Um, that's Stantonsburg, where I have this little star. Down here, this is, it says Martinsville, and which is the only reference I have ever seen to Eureka as Martinsville. But this is Eureka, right here. Mm -hmm. And all of these names, this is Black Creek, you can see it. All of these, Contentnia Creek, all of these are farm owners. These are houses. So as, as troops or scouts were sort of moving through the countryside, they could sort of know this is where this farm is and these are where these people are. Right here in the middle, and it is, I promise you this is what it says, but it's very difficult to read. That is a C, and that is Artis, A-R-T-I-S. Um, that says Watery Branch, so this is Watery Branch. That's where her farm <coughs> is. That is Celia Artis, reflected on, the, uh, on this Confederate farm uh, field map. Uh, in the same area as uh, Celia Artis, there were the Reed sisters, and the Reed sisters headed one of the wealth, wealthiest free black families in the county. Like uh, Celia Artis, both women uh, owned their husbands. Um, and by 1860, members of the extended Reed family claimed a total of $5,000 in real property and uh, almost $1,200 in personal property. Uh, Napoleon Hagen's. Uh, lived on Acock Swamp, west of, of Celia Artis and the Reeds. Uh, his mother had not been legally married, and he served an apprenticeship until 21. But upon reaching adulthood, he leveraged his relationships with white neighbors 
to begin buying land. Uh, Napoleon Hagen's home, which was actually built post-Civil War, is still occupied, and the road on which it stands is named for him. So this is up between Fremont and Eureka, and there's not only Napoleon Road, but there's Reedtown Road, and Reedtown is Reedtown because of the Reeds. Rhoda and uh, Tabitha were the Reed sisters. So this is the intersection. So this is ground zero for the free community of color um, in, in the Fremont Eureka area. This is Napoleon Hagen's house now. Um, I, I trespassed a little bit to get this, <laughs> <laughs> to get this photograph. Um, and the re I knocked on the door, nobody was home. The, the, the reason I had to trespass, this, this picture obviously is taken on the road, but Napoleon's grave is, if you go past the house and down into the cornfield, there's this, this plinth, there's this obelisk that's just standing there, and that's, his, that's he and his wife's grave. Um, but in, in 1880, um, there, was, there was a movement of um, black farmers out of North Carolina to Indiana. And they were being, uh, there were these men who were going around, I don't know if any of you have heard the exodusters. Uh, exodusters. These were migrants who primarily went to Arkansas and um, Oklahoma and Kansas and founded cities like Nic Nicodemus, Kansas and those places. Well you had men uh, Pap Singleton and others who were sort of going around telling people, listen, you don't have to stay in the South. You don't have to deal with this. You know, you can go to these other states and you can buy, you know, land grant property and you can set yourself up as a farmer. And there was a group of people who were going to Indiana, um, who were migrating to Indiana. And so there was a congressional inquiry. You know, what's going on here? Because of course, farmers in Wayne County were like, wait a minute, this is all my farm laborers, you know, and they're, they're being seduced away and they're being told all these lies and made all these promises. So there were congressional <coughs> hearings and Napoleon Hagens was subpoenaed to go to Washington to testify about the condi conditions for farmers in Wayne County. And this is from his testimony. Um, where do you live? Near Goldsboro. Um, 15 miles from town. What is your occupation? I'm a farmer. Do you own your land? Yes. How much? 485 acres. How did you get it? I worked for it. <laughs> Were you formerly a slave? No, sir. I was a free man before the war. What did you pay for it? I believe $5,500. Um, then I've got a little town lot there, but I don't count that. I think it's worth about 500 How much cotton do you raise? I don't raise as much as I ought to. I only raise 58 bales. How many hands do you work? I generally rent my land. I only worked four last year, and I paid the best hand who fed the mules and tended the house, so on and so forth. Um, he goes on to testify that when he reached adulthood, which would have been in the war era, era he went to uh, basically white men that he knew and got loans to buy his first property, and that that is how he built his property. Um, there's a lot to feel really good about, you know, with Napoleon Hagen's testimony. There's a lot that's not so progressive either. He very much downplays um, the conditions for, for uh, black people in Wayne County. He says, oh, I think it's pretty fair. I think people can get a fair shot. I think he was asked specifically about how the courts treated people. And he said, well, you know, if you don't commit any crimes, you won't wind up in court, you know, some other things. But, you know, you can't, it's hard to judge um, people. I mean, here's a man um, who, despite his, his, his achievements, his, his wealth, um, was illiterate. Um, he is in Washington. He is being grilled by United States senators. W what else is he going to tell them, um, except what, to some extent, they want to hear? But, um, all right, that's Napoleon Hagen's. <coughs> um, so there, there are farmers, people who are purely farmers like Napoleon Hagens, but there were also men who had skilled trades. And they had the most uh, economic opportunity in, an in Antebellum, Wayne County. For example, Hillary Hagens, Sherrard Hagens, uh, James King were carpenters. William Capps was a plasterer. 
Jordan Wiggins was a distiller. Uh, a man who had those types of skills could set aside uh, his income to buy land. Uh, Adam Artis is an example. Uh, Artis learned carpentry as an apprentice in Greene County. He lived in the uh, Bullhead area of northern Greene County. In 1855, he obtained a mortgage uh, from his brother-in-law, John Wilson, uh, on a purchase of 10 acres near Eureka. And by 1860, he'd accumulated uh, $200 in farmland and 100 in personal property. His descendants still live on property that he bought through his lifetime. He owned thousands of acres uh, by the time he died along the, uh, in the watery branch area. So if, you, if you're on 222 going from Eureka to Stansburg, you are rolling through Adam Artis territory. And this is his, uh, this is his grave, um, which is just off the side of the road uh, next to the houses where his descendants live. And uh, this, is the t this is a transcription of, his, of a mortgage he obtained on um, his first purchase of property. As I said, his brother-in-law bought it. His brother-in-law was also a free man of color, John Wilson. Don't know anything about him. I don't know when he bought the land because he'd never registered the deed. But obviously he bought it before 1855. He married Adam's sister, uh, Zilpha Artis. Uh, the most prosperous free people of color in the county included families who had been landowners since the 1830s. The Simmons family, which owned property in both Wayne and Duplin counties, included two mechanics and three coopers. The Wynn brothers, or cousins, Washington, Levi, Charles, Adam, James, Gray, uh, William, uh, were farmers who also practiced carpentry and blacksmithing. Levi Wynn and Adam Wynn owned slaves that they worked for profit. Uh, on Mar I made a, a mention earlier of the uh, Wilmington and, uh, and Weldon Railroad. Um, as, they, as this railroad was coming through uh, Southern Wayne County, it kind of hit a snag. And that snag was Adam Wynn, who would not sell uh, his property. He would not sell a right of way uh, for his property. And the, the railroad sued him twice to force him to uh, sell his right of way. And eventually he, he did. And that bit of land is believed to, to lie along what's now Center Street in, in Mount Olive. That was Adam Wynn uh, property. Uh, Green Simmons was a mechanic. George Simmons, a cooper. Charles Wynn, a blacksmith, were the only free men of color on the tax list for Indian Springs District in 1856. Um, this document is a, it's basically an, an, an IOU um, for, uh, for rent, for the, for the, the rent of, of farm property. And it's signed by Gray Wynn with an X, mm -hmm. Levi Wynn with an X, and Adam Greenfield with an X. And these men, all three men of color, um, sort of pool their resources to rent farmland for the for the mutual benefit of their uh, their families. It's it's um, a, an interesting document to me. It's one of the few. It's 1847, uh, one of the few that I've run across that sort of shows uh, the way in which farmers um, were. Uh, you know, were, were conducting their business and the relationships that they had uh, in the community. As an aside, um, Urban Lewis um, is, well, as another aside, I'm not a win, so I'm probably one of the few people with Dudley Roots who is not a win. <laughs> but I, I, I actually am descended from Urban Lewis, the, uh, you know, who, was, who was a white guy. Um, so uh, in 1848, William Burnett, a barber, was the only free person of color to af uh, appear in the Waynesboro list of, list of taxables. And when the county seat moved from Waynesboro to Goldsboro, he moved along with it and set up his, uh, his he was a barber who um, had a white, served a white clientele and he set up his business in, uh, in Goldsboro. Um, with the arrival of the Civil War, Wayne County's uh, free people of color 
generally tried to keep their heads down and just sort of ride out the, the, the conflict. There were a few, like Hillary Herring, who enlisted in the United States Colored Troops. Um, he, there is a, there is a uh, uh, pension application by his widow that was fought. He actually migrated to Air, uh, Arkansas later on, but it's got some interesting information about his, uh, his early life. Um, people who, who did not volunteer to, to join the troops were sometimes forced by Confederate government to work uh, building defenses uh, such as breastworks or supplying goods or services and uh, the same with the uh, Union troops. But after the war, if you had been forced to give up um, goods or money to aid the, the, the Union cause, you could file a claim on this, the Southern Claims Commission to get reimbursed for that. Whatever you had to give up to the Confederates was just lost. But for, for, for what you gave to the Southern Claims Commission, uh, you, could, you could try to get that back. And these are fascinating documents. Um, because the person would first testify to, you know, I'm, I'm X age, I was born in X place, um, I moved here. X, I mean, there, there are details about the movements of, of free people that you just cannot find anywhere else. Um, it's sick, Robert Aldrich, who is one of my ancestors, filed a claim. It, it's lost. It kills me that I, I can't, I don't have access to what was there. But here is, is, is an excerpt from the claim of Charles Wynn. He's 55, I live in Wayne County. I resided there during the war on my own land, 230 acres. Uh, he brought in witnesses who, who talked about what he had been forced to, what he had lost. So Tony Roberts, who was also a free people, person of color, mm -hmm. testified. Um, one thing that you had to do in order to make this claim was to uh, establish that you had not supported the Confederacy. So uh, Robert says, when believed the Union Army would succeed, he thought the cause was right, he was in it for the right thing, and he said secession would ruin the country. Uh, William Thompson testified that he had known Wynn for 24 years. He ho Wynn hoped the Union Army would be successful, but put down the rebellion and do away with slavery. Uh, here's another, this is John Herring. Uh, he's the father of Hillary who volunteered with the colored troops. Um, he said he lived in Grantham Township, which is the extreme uh, southwestern part of the county. Mm -hmm. He had 45 acres. Uh, him being a colored man, it's needless to question him as to loyalty. Uh, but he said Sherman's whole army was encamped within about a mile and a half and stayed there longer than I wanted them to. Um, I was always a free man. I was born free on my days as a farm, was a farmer. John Bryant Camps, who was also a free man of color, testified he had known Herring for 20 years. Um, Caps testified, shortly after the outbreak of the war, I was carried off by the rebels to serve as a cook. When I made an effort to get to my home, I would get home to my family, I was prevented and they gave me 50 lashes. I never knew a man of my color who did not wish to see the South get whipped <coughs> by way of satisfaction for the many whippings inflicted upon us. Uh, William Thompson says, I have yet to learn of the first colored man who was not in full sympathy with the Union cause. We all here were a prescribed people and during the war had to keep our mouths shut or they would have been collect effectively shut for us forever. So they're just powerful, powerful documents. Um, the, 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 you know, in people's own words, um, uh, the, the Southern Claims Com Commission, these files are stored um, at the US, um, at the National Archives in Washington, the originals. Um, so not surprisingly, after the war, uh, free people of color, free born uh, people of color were well situated to assume leadership positions uh, in this new society. Uh, Green Simmons, Levi Wynn, uh, brothers John Aldridge and Matthew Aldridge, whose families had come to Wayne from Samson during the war, uh, all held political office in the 1870s and 1880s. Napoleon Hagens, who we talked about earlier, <coughs> sent two of his sons, Henry and William, to college. Uh, William went to um, Howard and, and uh, Henry went to Shaw. And each worked as assistants to African-American U.S. Congressman George H. White. 
Hagen's third son, Joseph H. Ward, migrated to Indiana and became a prominent doctor whose clients included uh, Madam C.J. Walker. Uh, several of the Reeds, uh, the descendants of Rhoda and, and Tabitha, uh, migrated uh, not that far. They came up to Wilson. And Elijah Reed went to Tuskegee, became a veterinarian, became known as one of the best veterinarians in Wilson for what they call large uh, animal veterinarians, horses and that sort of thing. Uh, another descendant, J.D. Reed, was a school principal and a bank officer in Wilson. Uh, Freeborn men and women of color came together in 1870 to establish the first Congregational Church of Dudley. This was a church whose uh, original members were, were, were drawn from families that had been free prior to the, uh, to the Civil War. Many of their descendants, including many members of my family, are still members of this church. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, although little known today, uh, free people of color created vibrant communities in antebellum Wayne County. Despite their social and economic struggles, they forged a place for themselves in a world that was dominated by whites and enslaved Africans, and they left legacies that lifted their families for generations. There are not a lot of photographs that I have access to in any case, of free people of color, but I do have a few. And I also have photographs of uh, some of the grave sites um, that remain. So here, William and Penny Wynn Simmons uh, and their years of death. Um, some of their descendants uh, were Wayne County, a, a, another large group of their descendants uh, were in Samson and in, in Duplin. Uh, America Young Wynn on the left uh, was married to one there, Ch Charles Wynn. There were a couple of Charles Wynns. She was married to the oldest of the Charles Wynns. Uh, Eliza Simmons Bryant was a <coughs> daughter or granddaughter of Ferebe Simmons who registered her freedom statement uh, with the court. Eliza migrated to Ohio uh, and and founded a uh, charitable institution uh, there. Um, here's one of my ancestors. Uh, uh, this is Eliza Balcom Aldridge, who actually was born in Sampson County, but came to, uh, to Wayne County during the war. <coughs> uh, these are two of her sons, uh, Matthew Aldridge, who came to, uh, to Goldsboro, served for a while on the county commissioners, the, the Board of Aldermen, I'm sorry, as it was known at that time, and uh, George W. Aldridge, who settled in Fremont. Uh, this is Richard Artis, Sr. He was the brother of Adam T. Artis. Um, and this is Luvice Artis Aldridge, who was a daughter of of uh, Adam Artis. Adam Artis had 25, 30, 35 children. It's hard to say. Um, he had about six wives in, in sequence, to be fair, in sequence. Uh, and Vicey's mother was a Seabury. Napoleon Hagen's was her half uncle. Uh, so she was from the, uh, the northern part of the county, but she married an Aldridge from the southern part of the county, and she moved down <coughs> to Dudley, where he was. Um, here is the grave of Jonah Williams, um, who was a brother of Adam T. Artis and Richard Artis. Now you say, well, Williams, what's up with that? Their mother was a free woman of color. Their father was an enslaved man. Um, they had 10 children together. Most of the children took their mother's name, Artis. Two or three of the children, <coughs> uh, after their father was freed, used their father's name. And Jonah was one of the children who, who took Williams as a name. Jonah was the founder of uh, Turner Swamp, um, Free Will, or Missionary? Primitive Baptist. Primitive Baptist, yes. Yes, and he was um, instrumental in establishing primitive Baptist congregations throughout Wayne and Wilson counties. Um, 
his grave is the most interesting thing. I, I, I had an idea of where he was buried. This is up by Eureka. I don't know why I'm telling y'all this in front of my parents. Because <laughs> they would be horrified. Or will be horrified. But I knocked on somebody's door. I said, do you know of a cemetery somewhere around here? And he said, hold on a minute. He went and got his golf cart. And we drove, rode back up into the woods. <laughs> And there is, a, there is a cemetery, and there is Jonah Williams. It's, it's on Turner Swamp, of course, um, which is across the road from where the church is, but that's Jonah Williams. Uh, Francis Artist Diggs was a daughter of Celia, who we saw on the Confederate map. Um, their land is uh, in the Watery Branch area. This uh, little cemetery is, is right on the side of the road now. Um, a lot of her descendants actually moved to, to Wilson, but some of her family is still in that area. Um, now these are, these, the, the next graves that I'm gonna show you are all um, uh, in the Congregational Church Cemetery. Uh, so these are some wins over here among the oldest uh, Wynn Graves, Levi and his wife Betsy. Uh, then we've got Mary Greenfield, uh, Pinckney Wynn, uh, Riley Simmons, born 1841. Um, and here is just a sample of some of the surnames of free families of color in, in Wayne County. Um, there are a couple of names that you might think would be here that aren't. Mm -hmm. Henderson, for example. The reason is that the Hendersons didn't actually come to Wayne County until after the antebellum era. They came in, in the war era. Also, um, uh, Jacobs. The Jacobses didn't come to, they were free people of color, but they did not come to Wayne County until the 1870s. So they are not on this list. But these other, these other names are, um, all names that appear, families that appeared in, from say 1790 to 1860 uh, in, in Wayne County. So uh, I thank you for your attention. I thank you again for having me here. If, um, <laughs>